Thank you. So um, today we're gonna to be talking about for the next hour or so, the 2020 Okanagan water supply. And um, we do this about uh, this time every year. This is the seventh year that we've been doing this. And it's an opportunity really to talk a little bit about uh, what we anticipate is gonna be happening this year for snowpack, for reservoir levels, uh, for potential flood or drought. And this year we have um, the opportunity also to talk a little bit about water supply as it relates to the fisheries, uh, which I'm quite excited about. Uh, so my name is Nelson Jatel. I'm the Water Stewardship Director for the Okanagan Basin Water Board. And uh, I'll be the, the webinar guide today if I can uh, keep this technology working for everybody. Um, at this time also, I'll just mention that if anybody has some questions, there's two options in the bottom of your Zoom panel. Uh, one of them is uh, Q&A, and you can ask questions there either to a, a panelist or to the group. Uh, and then there's a, a sort of a chat um, bubble, and both of those will work well, and we'll, uh, we'll try to get to as many questions as possible if there are any. Um, this is a graphic that we show pretty much every year. It um, identifies the demand curve for water in the Okanagan. Um, and the blue bar is ultimately where we currently are. It's, it's no surprise that as we start getting into the warmer months of July, August, and, and now sometimes even September, the demand increases significantly. Um, much of this water is used for agriculture um, and uh, some of it's also used for outdoor watering, which makes up a large, uh, a large chunk of this, this demand curve that we anticipate uh, moving into uh, the 2020 uh, supply and demand year. And this, this effectively looks at the demand. So this morning we're gonna be talking about um, sort of at least three categories of, of uh, data sets. Uh, one of them is flow, and we'll be talking a little bit about snowpack and Okanagan Lake. Uh, and also a little bit about a Soyuz uh, Lake and what's going on there from the International Joint um, Commission. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion around groundwater. Uh, we'll be talking a bit about precipitation um, and, and sort of a climate forecast. And then this year, as I mentioned, we'll also be adding uh, sort of fish and fish needs to this conversation. So to introduce our panel today, um, we have uh, Dave Campbell from the BC River Forecast Center. We'll be talking about snowpack and, and in general, some of the inflow criteria for this upcoming year. Uh, we have Sean Reimer with us. We'll be talking about Okanagan River, uh, upper reservoirs, and, and also Okanagan Lake mainly and, and what's happening in the main stem. Uh, we've got Martin Suchi, who's gonna be letting us know about international soya lake levels um, and also um, highlighting some of the issues that have happened last year. Uh, we'll be hearing from Doug Lundquist, uh, really about uh, the weather forecast for this upcoming year. Uh, we have John Pogson from the province, who will be talking about groundwater supply. And we have Carrie Alexis from the ONA Fisheries Department. So that's your panel for 2020. Um, one of the reasons why we do this webinar is really to increase the amount of information that people have in their hands to be able to support better deci decision making throughout the Okanagan Basin. Uh, water supply has a number of competing interests in the Okanagan, and this is a great opportunity for us to be able to take a pause, take account of where we currently sit for the 2020 year, and um, really be as intentional as possible with how we use um, the water that's available to us in any given calendar year. Um, the Okanagan Basin Water Board takes a regional approach um, to water management issues. And we realize that there's significant variations between drainages, uh, that each water source needs its own water management strategy and, and many uh, sub-basins do exactly that. Um, but at the same time, because we're connected, we need a coordinated strategy. And today's conversation in part is to support and enable that coordinated strategy. This is an updated uh, graphic. Uh, each red bar here is a year of water that comes into the Okanagan Basin. Um, just two quick things to point out on this graph. One is that there's significant variation from year to year. And um, that's one of the challenges for managing water in the Okanagan. Uh, the other is that there's a general trend of, uh, of increased variability. You'll see that some of the highs are higher than we've experienced before and more frequently, uh, resulting in flood events um, like 17 and 18. 
Um, and similarly, um, some significant um, punctuated dry years that, uh, that really create issues on the drought side. Um, I spoke to this graph before. Um, I don't think I'll mention anything more about it. Okay, those are my intro comments. I think with that, I will uh, switch it over to David to talk a little bit about what's happening from the River Forecast Center. Let me see if I can swap out here. Perfect. David, you should be ready for, for a share. All right, hopefully that uh, you can hear me now and I'm- I can do it. And see the presentation. So I'll, I'll start, to, and I'll, I won't touch too much on some of the seasonal drivers. I think Doug is going to go into this in more uh, detail as respect to, to weather, but I will talk about some of the seasonal drivers in relation to snowpack. Uh, and particularly this year, um, you know, we've got a situation of a, a neutral El Nino condition, and then we've also got kind of mixed uh, temperature water off our coast. And this is really in contrast to what we've seen more frequently in the last uh, few years where we have had much more strong signals. And we do find when it comes to snowpack at least, um, that there's much more variability uh, in the snow that we see and how that snow melts, particularly in years where we don't have some of these strong ocean uh, temperature patterns in place. Uh, and so I think that's kind of the takeaway this year really is some of those factors that might've been more obvious in previous uh, recent years, uh, a little less so uh, this, this season. Uh, in terms of where we're at in terms of the snowpack, we released the April 1st bulletin uh, last week. And April for us really is that the best snapshot of the year for how much snow we have. Uh, we're typically very near the peak of uh, snow accumulation. And so we've got a good handle on what we've got in terms of the, the layup for the season. Um, if we look at kind of how things have progressed into, into that April period, we did start the year uh, a little bit low. It was uh, a bit drier uh, in the earlier parts. Uh, and then we saw a pretty significant uh, snow accumulation. Most of the snow we saw in terms of growth uh, through the Okanagan occurred in that uh, January into a bit, a bit into February period. So we started out 91% in January up to 129% to normal in February. And then things have more or less kind of tapered off. We we've, we've still have seen um, growth of the snowpack, but it's been at a, a lower than seasonal rate for the last couple of months um, in terms of its growth. So we're sitting at uh, April with 116% to normal for the basin average. And um, we can look at some of the kind of historic years there uh, in recent years. So we're, we are below that uh, uh, 2018 and uh, 2016 uh, level in terms of the snowpack. Um, the one thing we are seeing this year as well is a, a fair bit of a uh, high degree of variability across the watershed. Uh, so I've got a couple of examples from snow pillows here from Mission Creek, so the higher elevation uh, on the east side of the, the basin, and then Brenda Mines, which is our kind of uh, go-to for looking kind of more ele mid-elevation snowpack, and it's uh, towards the west uh, over in the, the connector. David, could you take uh, a couple of seconds and explain the x and y axis on these graphs? Sure. So on, uh, on these curves, we've got uh, the date or the time along, along the bottom. Uh, and then uh, on the y-axis, we've got the snow water equivalent. So that's the amount of water stored in the in the snowpack, uh, kind of relative to a, a depth of water for melted. So we can look at this in the same way that we look at total precipitation, for example, and it's measured in millimeters. Uh, and we've got the color coding and shaded areas is the historic statistics. So we've got a, a max and minimum uh, at the top and the bottom uh, edge of the, the shading. And then the, the kind of difference between the green and the blue along the middle, that's that's the median value. So the kind of average that we'd expect to see. Uh, and then um, different statistics, whether it be the 25th percentile or the, the 80th or, or 90th um, percentiles. 
Uh, so it gives us an idea as we get into the further shaded areas, it's much more extreme condition. Uh, and particularly when we're in those sort of the last shaded area, which we're in, certainly in the, the Mission Creek side of things, is, you know, it's something that we would only see 10% of the time or less. So it's, it's, it's a fairly rare occurrence. And I've got uh, black as the trace for this year. And so we're in that mid-April period right now. Uh, and I've got traces from previous years just for the comparison side of things. Uh, so we've got, um, you know, looking at the different basins, we can kind of see that 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 all years are not created equal. It's not a blanketed snowpack across the basin that is that is the same, and that we do have those regional uh, spatial variation kind of year to year. And so we look back to a couple of recent years. 2018 was certainly a high snowpack year um, in, in in the watershed, uh, as we saw before. Uh, and then 2017 uh, was certainly a, a larger volume year in terms of the inflow. And a large part of that is not from the snow, really, but uh, as we can see here, you know, it's, it's certainly we've got less snow. Um, certainly in the Mission Creek site, uh, we had less snow in 2017 than we have right now. But really that rainfall that we saw through the season was, was a big determinant. If we look at all of the individual snow measurements, we've got about four uh, snow pillows, snow weather stations across the basin that are real time. Uh, and then there's a, a, a large handful or a large number of manual sites that are measured as well. And if we look at those across the basin, there really is a huge variability in, in those. The lowest uh, measurements at 80% of normal, uh, and then it ranges up to 183%. So it, it really is quite a, a mixed uh, picture this year. And uh, um, certainly there's localized areas that have these higher snowpacks, but it's not something that is uh, ubiquitous across across the basin. And we can see also just uh, in terms of the black line on the Brenda Mines uh, graph on the right, we're, we are kind of bouncing around a little bit. We're probably near or, or at the peak now. We're starting to see that that snow is consolidating, ripening, and starting to, to potentially melt. And we expect that certainly through the valley uh, valley sides at this point, uh, mid elevations are, are into that melt pattern now with uh, the weather we've had. Um, to kind of hammer on this, this point a little bit more, this is just a couple snapshots of modeled output from uh, the American uh, uh, NOAA group. And so we've got spatially modeled uh, snowpack, and this is just a comparison between 2015, sorry, 20, uh, this year, 2020 and, and, and 2018 on the on the right. And uh, it could kind of show really that sort of spatial variability and particularly the modeled output is that, that the mid and lower elevation snow is much, much lower this year. Whereas we go to the high elevation terrain like Mission Creek and, and it may not look that different uh, in those locations or in a location like that, but, but actually across the base and uh, uh, we're not quite as high uh, in terms of the snowpack as 2018. Uh, on the lake side of things, uh, and, and again, I'll kind of go into these graphs. Uh, I'll focus on the bottom one as, a, as an example. Uh, we use the similar shading uh, on this, but this is, in this case is the, the, the trend of lake level on Okanagan Lake uh, across the, 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 the months uh, going across the x-axis. And so again, that kind of blue, the, actually in this case, the, the green and the, the uh, the gray line in the middle of the green is is the average condition as we go through and then we've got uh, traces from 2017 and 2018 and you can see that both those years actually went beyond the historic statistics so we're we're sort of having the water survey we don't have the updated statistics to, to rerun them uh, they haven't published the final numbers from 2017 and 2018 yet so it's not part of the data set you can see both those years were actually outside of the historic range in terms of the time and the and the, the levels that we saw in the lake um, and we can see where we're at right now in terms of lake level, and I can see the greens a little bit tricky to see, uh, but we're we're following the black trend as we're uh, a little bit below the or, or near the normal for for this time of year. But we've really seen that uh, drop, and I think Sean Reimer will talk about this more in detail. But we can contrast that to 2017, where the lake was quite a bit higher at this time of year. Uh, we do volume inflow projections through our forecast center to to help get a handle on it, what the uh, projected inflow uh, into Okanagan Lake be, might be over the season. And we've got a couple different models that we use. One, a statistical model that looks at historic conditions and, and antecedent conditions coming into the season and uses that to predict uh, inflow. And that's, that's the main model we've been using uh, up until recently. And we've got from that uh, uh, a forecasted inflow of uh, between 132 and 135% of normal. That's, that depends on when we're looking to now till June or now to July per periods. Um, 
and, and we can see that number is a fair bit higher than what the snowpack is. And I think what's happening there really is that uh, the model does really look at things like Mission Creek or some of the higher elevation sites that are quite high, and it, it, it may be kind of over-interpreting or overestimating the snowpack based on that. Um, for the Kalavalka Lake, we've got 115 to 128% uh, of normal inflow. Uh, we've also got a, a, an ensemble uh, hydrologic model. So what, what this does is, is simulates the flow across the, the basin based on the conditions we've seen through the winter, the weather, and the, the buildup of the snowpack. And then we project onto that um, um, 100 years or so of uh, 80 years of scenarios of weather that we've observed. Uh, and then what would that uh, look like on the river uh, inflow uh, if we were to get that this year? So we've got a, a number of different scenarios and we can do the statistics based on that. So our forecast from the Raven model is 115% of normal, much closer to the snowpack. Uh, and then we can look at something like a, a 10th percentile range. So we would expect that, uh, um, you know, there's a 10% chance we'd be below 94% uh, of inflow in this case, or a 10% chance we'd be above 145%. So that gives us a bit of a range. Uh, and to put these kind of numbers into context in terms of what was observed and, and uh, harkening back to the, the graph that uh, Nelson showed at the start of, uh, uh, start of the talk, uh, you know, looking at 2018, we were at 174% of, of uh, normal inflow over these same periods, and then the 2017, 190%. So to put some context to, to, to the numbers, um, and certainly would caution when we look at these, you know, really these inflow forecasts, inflow projections are, are, are not really something that predict whether an extreme event is going to happen or not. We can we, do, we can recognize that those are always going to be a possibility. And particularly when we look at something like the Okanagan where rainfall can play a huge, um, a huge role in terms of the inflow. Uh, we haven't done like specific analysis, but certainly it's it's probably on the order of you know 30 or 40% of the inflow on, on high inflow years from rain can can come from that uh, precipitation. So it really does um, like what we saw in, in 2017 with not much of a snowpack, but very high uh, inflows as a result of that rainfall. So scenarios like that are always possible. And I think that we've experienced them uh, in recent years as well. We know that um, there's something that can happen and really are irrespective of the snow that we have right now. Um, just a snapshot of where we're at this season, you know, as I mentioned, we're, we're, we're really starting to turn that corner into the melt season now and seeing warming, warming up and, and, and Doug will talk about this more. Um, but getting into the flow of the season now, we're a, a tad bit late starting uh, just with some cooler weather over the last couple of weeks or so, um, but we're just starting to see the upswing in rivers. So this is an example from Mission Creek. Uh, and we're, we're just starting to see that bend curve of, of sort of the flat line from uh, winter conditions and starting to ramp up into, into freshet and about normal for this time of year. Uh, the, the table or the uh, map on the, on the left really just shows dots based on uh, the hydrometric gauges from water survey and if we're in that kind of uh, green state where we're normal for this kind of year so we're tracking where we should be and then some of those ones that are orange are just a little bit uh, lower uh, in response to you know, kind of dry and, and a bit delayed and then the, the dark blues are more related to uh, the managed outflow that Sean's going to talk about along the Okanagan River system. Uh, so summarize then the outlook. Um, at this point, we're not really expecting any significant changes to the snow that we've got right now with, with the current weather patterns we've got. We do expect that we'll be transitioning into the, the melt season here as we, we come into the next uh, uh, week or two or, or three here. Um, uh, overall, we do have um, kind of a moderate uh, uh, snowpack in terms of flood risk through the Okanagan, but there are some areas I mentioned before that do have fairly fairly high snowpack. Uh, and then kind of just touching again that that really how this snow melts is going to be a real um, critical factor determining what we get in terms of flow. So the, the risk is really partly from the snowpack and, and then partly from the weather that, that acts on that. Um, in terms of scenarios, certainly the, the cool, uh, and then transitioning to very hot uh, later uh, is, is a concern. We do push the risk higher as we, we, we delay the melt. Uh, and then again, that, that wet weather scenario, whether it be ongoing heavy rain or ongoing wet weather that we saw in 2017, for example, or whether it just be extreme event uh, weather that comes through that can cause issues like we've seen a number of times on, uh, on the smaller rivers throughout the, the watershed in recent years. I think positive scenarios are going to be kind of this, even the back and forth between a bit of warm and a bit of cool or kind of seasonal temperatures, uh, but nothing too dramatic in terms of heat. And, and as we go into the melt here, um, continuing to see dry weather, I think is also a positive scenario. Uh, so that's all I have and I can, I can pass it back to you, Nelson. 
Thanks so much, David. And uh, I'll pass the baton to Sean if uh, you could share your screen. Absolutely. And is everyone seeing that? You should be seeing, oh, wait a second, I gotta press that last button. Perfect. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. So I'll, uh, as mentioned, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more just about uh, uh, the Okanagan Lake regulation system, the main stem lakes and, and rivers. Uh, and I'm gonna sort of uh, expand upon a little bit what uh, David was talking about in terms of the inflows uh, and the effect and impacts on uh, Okanagan Lake management. So uh, what you're seeing here are some graphics of the uh, inflows that we've seen up to this point uh, into Okanagan Lake. So the top graph uh, is showing the cumulative since the uh, beginning of October. And what we're looking at on the y-axis are a million of cubic meters or billion cu cubic liters if you uh, are more comfortable with that terminology. And to put things in perspective, each million or 10 million cubic meters is worth about three centimeters on Okanagan Lake. So that each one of those tiny, the smaller check marks in the top chart uh, is worth about uh, 10 centimeters, sorry, three centimeters. So uh, maybe that helps people visualize a little bit in terms of the water. Uh, the chart on the bottom, again, it's a, a different scale because it's in weekly. Uh, the black bars show a 30-year normal uh, weekly inflow into Okanagan Lake. And then uh, the blue bars are what we've seen till now. And what you can see is that certainly starting in the end of December through to February, we were seeing a wetter than normal period. And that was when those uh, storm activities that we probably remember came through and, and, and uh, resulted in that uh, bigger snow buildup. Uh, and, and then once we got into uh, the end of February through March and, and right up till now, you can see that our inflows um, have been below normal. And that is um, caused both by the um, cool, sort of late cool uh, weather we've been having through that period where the snow was not melting uh, at normal rates, as well as the fact that it has just been drier than normal. Again, just gonna talk about where we've gotten to at this point. Uh, these are the uh, projections that uh, David provides. And again, when we look at the uh, dates of the forecasts, we uh, receive them monthly um, in response to the manual snow surveys being done. Uh, and so that uh, each one of these forecasts are from February through to the end of July, March to the end of July, April to the end of July. So while they're different in terms of the volume, um, maybe the more important thing to look at is the percentage of normal. So we started off February, uh, March, uh, again, 148, 155% of normal in terms of uh, predicted inflows. And it's important to understand that, that, that these numbers do drive uh, our decision-making process in terms of where we're taking uh, Okanagan Lake in anticipation of a high or low runoff uh, and uh, potential flooding. So uh, I put on here how uh, our April 1st forecast uh, in terms of 621 million cubic meters is about 180 centimeters on Okanagan Lake. And what we've done is brought Okanagan Lake down uh, to about 106 centimeters below our, our full pool target that we try to get to near the end of June. And so we do have, uh, again, that makes 106 centimeters of water, uh, of room, where we actually want uh, the lake to fill with the runoff. And we're trying to then pass 74 million uh, meters, cubic meters, before the end of July. So here's the uh, Water Survey of Canada gauge uh, going back to the beginning of 2020. And uh, the dotted blue line is the median uh, lake level. 
for the period of record. And you can see where uh, Okanagan Lake, we've dropped it down uh, below the median record, again, just in anticipation of that uh, uh, runoff. Here's just sort of a different look at it. This is an output from the fish water management tool. And the difference here, of course, is the black line is, is showing where we've come to uh, since the beginning of the year. Um, and then the blue is what is projected. And it's uh, important to understand that uh, those projections are based both on uh, the River Forecast Center estimate of 621 million cubic meters, as well as what we have as a schedule of outflows uh, from uh, Okanagan Lake Dam. Uh, and it, like I say, those uh, projections are in blue. And so that when you look at the bottom left, uh, you can see where we've been to this point and, and we have been above average. Uh, so we're just above 30, um, 30 cubic meters per second outflow. Uh, and even up to a few weeks ago, we were probably projecting that we would have to go up to 60 cubic meters per second uh, based on those higher inflow forecasts uh, going back to February uh, to July and March to July. But because it, uh, the inflow forecast has been downgraded somewhat, um, it's looking like we can downgrade our, our release schedule as well. So right now we're only anticipating to go up to about 45 cubic meters per second, which takes some of the pressure off of uh, the flow in Oliver. Um, and what it does really is it gives us some flexibility in terms of our management. If conditions change and we do get more water than uh, anticipated, higher than the uh, inflow projection, uh, then we have an ability to raise those flows. Uh, and at the same time, if it continues to stay dry uh, and, and we have a very measured snow melt, uh, we may even not raise the flows um, to the 45 cubic meters per second that we see in uh, June and July. I'm just going to speak to Kalamalka Lake uh, quickly. Uh, Kalamalka Lake is higher than it was for the same time in 2018. This is uh, somewhat of a concern, uh, mainly because a lot of the uh, snowpack that we're seeing uh, in that patchiness that uh, David Campbell was talking about uh, seems to be in the north and west and, and, and part of the Kalamalka Lake drainage. So there's some concerns there. Um, and there's been a lot of inflow through the from the beginning of the year. Um, this Water Survey of Canada um, snapshot was taken from the beginning of the year, and un until um, and then you can see where the lake was starting to draw down. Uh, but then near the beginning of the year, uh, Kalamaka Lake started to rise. And this is despite the fact that we had uh, all the gates on the dam uh, wide open. So this could drive some uh, higher flows through Vernon Creek and through the city of Vernon. Um, and, but it's, it's still a little bit too early to tell. Uh, but certainly it's a pay attention to at this point. And that's all I have unless there's any questions. Sean, that's excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, Martin, I'll ask for, uh, for your, you to share your screen. Absolutely. Okay. And there we go. That looks okay. Great. Um, yeah, so let's just uh, move on here. So uh, basically just a little uh, summary of the uh, International Service Lake Board of Control. Um, a couple uh, key points here is that uh, the Okanagan River is the um, primary uh, inflow input to a Soyuz Lake. Um, however, under uh, certain conditions during freshette, um, the Similkameen River, which uh, flows into the Okanogan River downstream of Osoyoos Lake, uh, can create a backwater effect uh, and impact Osoyoos Lake outflows, and occasionally even reverse flows at uh, Zozel Dam. Um, so, 
couple points here about just the orders of approval uh, under which uh, Soyuz Lake is managed. So originally the uh, set up in 1946 and we're currently operating under a 2013 supplemental order of approval. And um, yeah, we'll go on from there. A couple uh, just uh, highlights for board membership uh, on the US side. We have uh, a new board member, Arnie Marchand, who's a private citizen, but uh, a member of the Colville tribe. And uh, on the US side, uh, David Hutchinson uh, is, who's the acting, or actually the regional chief for uh, Pacific and North Operation, hydrometric operations for uh, the Water Survey of Canada is now the Canadian co-chair. Um, and uh, I wanna to touch briefly upon 2019 before I move on to 2020. 2019 was a challenging year. Um, we were uh, operating, uh, or, or uh, some of the forecasts and lake levels were right uh, close to the thresholds that uh, the board uh, operates under for uh, drought uh, criteria. So in order to declare a drought for a Soyuz lake, uh, you have to have uh, two out of three conditions have to be met. So. The um, flow in the Smilkameen River at Nighthawk uh, for the period of April through to July uh, has to be below uh, 1 million acre feet. Apologize for the Imperial units. This is what the board uh, operates under. Uh, and early April and uh, May forecasts were uh, below that. And so basically the drought criteria was met. And then the other thing is one of the two uh, drought criteria for Okanagan Lake has to be met. So one is the either net inflow for the period of April through to July, or second is the lake level itself. And um, originally forecasts uh, for April and May showed that uh, those criteria would not be met. Uh, but uh, in effect, uh, later into June or into, into May, later in May and beginning of June, we were uh, right on the threshold and uh, ultimately uh, the drug criteria were not met. However, the dam op uh, operator did request uh, something we call a condition 10 variance. It's basically to operate under condition eight uh, rules. Uh, so they are uh, where they can allow operate under higher lake levels uh, to have additional water available for uh, in-stream flow needs and irrigation needs in the uh, lower Okanogan River. Uh, later in through the summer and early fall. Uh, Washington State had declared um, a drought for the Okan Okanogan Basin and uh, there was uh, concern. So the, the board uh, recommended and the IJC commissioners approved that variance in, in, on June 7th. Uh, and you can see here uh, that um, you know, the lake levels uh, ultimately uh, did not, uh, for uh, Okanagan, ultimately uh, did not meet uh, the drought uh, criteria, but uh, it was quite close. For 2020, uh, the early forecast, so from the River Forecast Center and um, the uh, net inflows. So for Okanagan Lake, uh, we're well above the threshold and uh, currently the forecast for um, uh, Okanagan Lake levels are above the threshold as well. We are, however, for the Similkameen, uh, just uh, just over the threshold right now. And in fact, as of this morning, I just checked, it's uh, the forecast is uh, 790,000 uh, acre feet. So we are below the threshold and we are gonna be monitoring that quite closely. The board did send a letter to the Washington Department of Ecology, who's the operator of the dam, indicating that um, uh, for early April drought criteria was not met, but uh, that the board would be monitoring that closely. Uh, again, so now for a Soyuz Lake level, so for 2019, um, we'll show here where the uh, condition 10 was granted. And basically what that allowed is the, the lake level to be operated at a higher level. Uh, so that's the red dotted line. And um, uh, as opposed to the regular or normal condition levels uh, where uh, the gray area. And uh, they did surpass that uh, the uh, the rule curve a couple times uh, in 2019 there in the summer that was resulted from uh, some uh, storm precipitation and some um, storm surge. Uh, uh, but th those uh, exceedances were quite low and, and were quickly returned to below the, uh, the rule curve. 
for 2020, uh, currently the uh, lake is within its uh, normal um, rule curve and uh, lake levels are increasing uh, steadily uh, throughout the uh, spring here. And um, so we, uh, oops, and uh, basically the, uh, the lake, the operator, the dam operator is, is uh, starting to, to hold back water uh, in anticipation of uh, some potentially lower flows in this milk mean. Uh, but we do have uh, freshet, as uh, Sean and, and David mentioned, uh, freshet flows are, are coming here. Uh, back to the similkamine, um, so current discharges, they're, they're beginning to increase, but they are close to the, uh, the mean uh, uh, historical discharge. Uh, currently, it's uh, 1,578 uh, CFS, so cubic feet per second, which is 444.5 uh, uh, cubic meters per second. Um, and uh, again, uh, drought criteria, uh, that's kind of uh, going to be um, something to monitor in terms of uh, the forecasts from the Northwest River Forecast Center for that uh, April to July snow mean cumulative flow. Uh, the other thing, the other stations, uh, the board uh, monitors quite closely is the uh, Okanagan River at Oliver, which is a water survey of Canada station. Uh, because that is a primary indicator for inflows to Soyuz Lake. Uh, again, these have been uh, steadily decreasing since mid-February, but uh, well above uh, normal um, mean discharge, as Sean had uh, previously indicated. Uh, and then the Okanogan River at Oroville, uh, which is a USGS gauge, uh, is a primary indicator of outflows from, from Zozo uh, Dam. And uh, again, well above normal. Uh, variable, but uh, we expect those, um, and we expect those to uh, increase due to uh, freshet. But also, uh, as the um, Zozo Dam operator uh, holds uh, water back, then um, we might see a delayed response there. A uh, couple special projects I just wanted to highlight for the um, Osoyoos Board of Control. One is uh, there's now a Zozo Dam webcam. That was completed last spring. That's uh, USGS. It's also on uh, our the uh, board website. Um, the other thing is the high water monuments. So there's uh, monuments going up in both Oroville and uh, Osoyoos. The Osoyoos one is complete. It's by the uh, Memorial Fountain by the Highway 3 Bridge. So in the lake itself, there's a, a pole and uh, high water marks indicating uh, the high flood years. So 1894, 1972, 74, 97, and, and 2018, which was the fourth, uh, fourth highest uh, level on record. The, um, the U.S. Uh, mem uh, monuments will be installed at Veterans Memorial Park, um, and that has yet to be completed. There's some negotiations going on there right now. Uh, the other big project that the board's got uh, going right now is uh, it's re regarding climate change adaptation. So the board is undertaking a multi-year, multi-phase project to analyze the vulnerability of the Soyuz Lake and, and the IJC order of approval to a projected shift in the climate. So phase one is a Simokami hydrologic model that has uh, just begun now. Uh, the contractor is uh, NHC uh, consultants. Um, they have just uh, completed or in the process of completing a Okanagan uh, a hydrologic model. And uh, in phase two of this project, uh, the, the Okanagan and the Simokami models will be integrated and uh, they'll be able to evaluate projected lake levels uh, and future rule curve uh, during uh, projected climate change. So that's coming up uh, next year and uh, that might have an impact on, on the um, orders of approval for a Soyuz Lake. And I just want to wrap up by uh, just highlighting the board website, uh, ijc.org. Uh, E-N-O-L-B-C, and uh, lots of information there about the board's mandate, membership, um, Zozo Dam, emergency contacts, maps, links, and um, the, the webcam uh, and reports and meeting minutes. So that's all available to the public. And that's it. That's it. Thank you very much. Martin, thank you very much. Um, next, we have John Pokeson from the provincial government to talk about groundwater. 
Which one? How's that? That looks excellent. You're 10 by 10. Excellent. Great. Thanks, Nelson. Uh, yeah, my name is John Pogson. I'm a regional hydrogeologist with the Ministry of Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development. Uh, I'm going to present an overview of uh, select observation wells within the Okanagan, but I just will remind people that we do uh, maintain a network throughout, throughout the uh, province uh, with monitoring wells uh, installed within uh, developed aquifers. Okay, before we get going though, because there's a fair bit of information on these graphs, uh, I'll just orient you to the, to the slides themselves. So uh, on the top, um, I'll present in the red line is the current year's data. Uh, 2019 or last year's data is the green line. Uh, the range of historical min max values is that light gray shaded area. And then there's a historical average that's calculated, which is uh, represented by that thin black line. Uh, I did attempt to do the historical averages for the period of record, but uh, sometimes the data doesn't allow for that. And that's uh, in which case I would have used a more recent tenure, which is uh, what is exampled here. And at the bottom of the slide, you'll see um, the full period of record presented as a, as a graph uh, and the date uh, when that period started is presented on the left hand side. So starting with Spelumsheen, uh, just south of Armstrong, uh, you'll find that the groundwater levels at, uh, at Splumsheen are, are, are pretty much similar to what we've seen in 2019 and actually 2018 for that matter, and within historical uh, min-max ranges. I'm going to move south now to Winfield. Uh, in Winfield, um, that's a surficial aquifer uh, on the north side of Ellison Lake. 2020 levels are currently slightly lower than those observed in 2019, but they still maintain a, a fairly strong uh, positive difference over the historical average value. Moving down further along Ellison, this one is, is, is interesting. It's, um, it's located near the Kelowna Airport. Uh, 2020 levels are slightly higher than 2019 max recorded values. So we are actually setting a new maximum level for this well. Um, the signal, as you can see, as you move to the right, it's, um, it's getting a bit muted over time and we may not actually be seeing that Frechette signal quite, uh, quite yet. This, I will, warn people uh, when looking at this one. This well is, is relatively new. Uh, the period of record only dates back to 2014. Um, so we're still, uh, we're going to keep an eye on this one um, as we get a longer period of record and see if things start to uh, stabilize a little bit. We move down to Rutland. Um, this is a fairly long period of record. We have 14 years of data for this particular well. Uh, 2020 levels are currently slightly lower than average levels, but they're trending upward and within that historical um, min max range. Moving quite a bit further south, closer to where I am in Penticton, this is Twin Lakes. Uh, 2020 levels are tracking more or less near that historical average and definitely down after some of the record setting that we saw in the early part of, uh, of last year. Not too far from Twin Lakes, you'll find Willowbrook observation well 282. Uh, and similar to Twin Lakes, uh, 2020 levels are tracking fairly closely with the historical average values. Uh, to Kalnuit, or this is near um, Oliver. Uh, 2020 levels are tracking at or above the historical average values. And uh, we may see some further increases as we head uh, further into Frechette. And then I'm going to finish up with uh, observation well 402. Now that's a um, observation well set up on Anarchist Mountain above Vesuvius. It's a bedrock well and it's, uh, it was constructed to monitor recharge and the effects of climate change. So over the winter, we saw low water levels and similar to those that we saw last year, um, but this well doesn't usually show its true character until closer to the end of April and May. So we'll be keeping an eye on this one as we get uh, into the into the freshet and that higher level melting. Just to summarize, 
Uh, generally speaking, uh, there are some, some nuanced differences throughout the valley, but generally speaking, uh, water levels are higher than historical averages. Um, with some exceptions, uh, Rutland being one of those exceptions. Uh, high elevation wells are reporting slightly below average water levels, but we expect to see increases as that snow melt and recharge occurs in those upland bedrock aquifers. And high water levels in some of the south and central Okanagan wells. Uh, examples are that newer well, uh, 442 at Ellison, and then uh, to Kulnuit or Oliver, 407. And then I would like to finish up just by um, showing people some of the information that is available out there. All of the data that I presented today is publicly available. Uh, the groundwater level data um, can be uh, obtained from the uh, groundwater level data interactive map. Uh, that's that link at the top. Uh, this long-term trends in groundwater, that's a document that I, I think I spoke about last year, um, but it is, it's probably still rel relevant and it gives a really good provincial overview on groundwater levels. Uh, and coming soon, we just completed a PGOWN review. Uh, so that will be a document that folks can take a look at and it should uh, present some recommendations for, for future uh, changes or upgrades to the, to the network. Lastly, um, none of this could be presented if it weren't for the hard work of Twy Legault, who's the uh, groundwater technician that, uh, that maintains the network in the Okanagan. And that's my contact at the bottom if you want to get a hold of me if you have any further, further questions. That's it. Thanks, Nelson. John, thank you so much. You're welcome. Now I'll uh, turn the mic over to Carrie for uh, uh, an update on fisheries. Uh, okay, okay. Oh. Um. I don't have a presentation. I do have a pretty picture. Um, but I, to switch it over, I think I need, um, yeah, I think that's what I need. <laughs> Still not quite there yet. All right. Um, so I have a, just a bit of an update on uh, the sockeye and kokanee that, uh, home here in the Okanagan. Uh, they're, the time period that they uh, have been here, uh, that they're here is during their incubation. So sockeye and kokanee spawn in the fall, they incubate in the, either the lakes for the kokanee and the sockeye and the rivers uh, over the winter and they're, they're about to sort of emerge and move into their new homes, um, move into their new homes in the, uh, where am I? All right, did that work? Am I shared? Uh, I don't see it, but that's okay, Gary. Oh, here we go. Perfect. Thanks. Nice. Does that work? Yeah. Um, so uh, sockeye that have been incubating in the Okanagan River most likely have experienced some scour due to uh, increase in water levels uh, in the early part of um, or late February or, uh, and throughout March. Uh, they normally will be peaking around the end of April in the next week or two. That's when they'll be emerging uh, from the gravel and heading down to either um, Skaha Lake or Soyuz Lake. Uh, we don't anticipate any scour in uh, Penticton, but we do feel that they're most likely impacted uh, for the Soyuz Lake population. Um, typically, scour occurs when the river levels get higher than 28, and they've been fluctuating slightly over 30. So again, not possibly not a significant amount, but we won't know until we can kind of track their numbers through the, um, uh, to their life stages in the lakes as well as their sort of return journeys. Kokanee um, have also been experiencing um, a slight bounce of desiccation uh, as they shore spawn in Okanagan Lake, uh, and this is due to the early lake drawdown. So they also typically um, peak uh, emerge sort of end of April, early May, depending on water temperatures. So we are impact, we are expecting impacts um, on the kokanee uh, recruitment this, this year. Um, but again, we wouldn't, it's yet to be seen until we um, have been able to assess what their, uh, the fries in the lake and the returns um, for them in four years. The, um, there's also sort of out migrating um, 
from an, an in-migration as a tributary. So there's still a sort of a high risk for any kokanee that are stream spawning in any of the tributaries. Um, this is their sort of risky period, um, similarly to for them to get uh, into the lakes. So uh, just sort of a kind of tracking flows in all of the, the tributaries where kokanee typically um, spawn in many of the tributaries to the Okanagan Lakes. And uh, finally, the question that we always get asked um, is how many fish are potentially returning this year? This is going to be a, a good year, uh, we understand from some of the ocean studies. So we're anticipating about 150,000 Okanagan sockeye returning to Penticton uh, Oliver spawning areas. Uh, this is them. They typically start moving into Passabonoville Dam in the uh, uh, late June, early July. Uh, we don't really see them in the system up here until late July. Uh, so it really depends if they get cooked on the system before they before they get back here is how many will potentially be showing up on the spawning grounds, but we're hoping that this is, this can kind of maintain itself as a good recruitment year. And that is all of the uh, updates I have. If there was any uh, questions or That's great, Carrie. Comments. And uh, we will hear Doug's and then we'll come back to questions. Appreciate that. Uh, Doug, you're up. Okay, I'm on. There you go. Can you see that, Nelson? I can and, and hear you loud and clear. Thanks, Doug. Perfect. Okay, good morning, everybody. Yeah, so here I have an update of where we have been and where we're headed for weather over the next little while in through the rest of spring and into early summer. Uh, let's see if I can forward my screen. Okay, so I'll go through the past, the present, the future, and give you some tools and a couple of interest items at the end. I'm going to start with this slide that shows at the top, the precipitation that we've had over about the last three months and the bottom, the temperature trend. I picked Kelowna as a central point in the Okanagan water basin. Uh, as we heard from David Campbell, there has been quite a variable amount of snow from one end to the other. And just if I were to post up a similar graph for the north and south Okanagan, Verdon had uh, and up towards the Shushwap had much more snow and precipitation throughout the winter and into uh, springtime early spring, uh, then we did further, further south in the central and south Okanagan. Temperature wise, uh, in the, on the bottom graph, you can see how uh, some of the presenters have mentioned it was quite a bit above average for a while, up to about early March. And since early March, it's been cool in general with a few really warm periods recently, but kind of what wavering back and forth more on the cool side than the warm side. So in summary, for the last 90 days, for much of the Okanagan, it's been relatively dry and also uh, fairly cool, at least recently. The next slide I wanted to present, I didn't put anything about uh, ENSO, so La Nina or El Nino or the sea surface temperatures, because I don't see anything particularly out of the ordinary that catches my spidey senses there, but Arctic sea ice has. And this is a graph from yesterday of the area in square kilometers of Arctic sea ice. The blue line is where we are. The uh, gray line is where we should be. And the bands above and below are the uh, interquartile and interdecile range for Arctic sea ice. And you can see as of recently, we're way below average. And I think this has something to do with our weather, weather patterns in that we're at times getting locked into weather patterns longer than we used to because the temperature gradient between the North Pole of the North and the equator is less than it used to be. So I think this does have an effect for us and it's perhaps part of the reason why it's been fairly dry and cool lately because we got locked into a ridge just west offshore and a northwesterly fairly dry flow across the BC interior. So anyway, we'll get into the upcoming weather and we're it is forecast to be incredible for the next little while. Like this is something perhaps we 
we want. We haven't seen that in the last few weeks. So the transition is here. And the reason is finally that Northwest flow is breaking down and we're getting more into a westerly flow. So I just put up the icons there from the forecast for the next week and it's forecast to be incredible with uh, perhaps a cold front coming through on Friday night into Saturday, just giving us a few showers, but not much in the way of precipitation accumulation. But temperature, at least for the next three days into the mid-teens, and then getting well into uh, the low to mid-20s for early next week, and perhaps cooling down a little bit more by mid-next week. But this is the kind of thing we want to see this time of year as far as freshette goes, because we don't want a lot of precipitation. At the same time, we want to see some warmer periods interspersed with a little bit of colder weather, like David Campbell said, just so we can get the, the snow melting, but not at a too fast a rate. And at the same time, if it's too cold, we'll delay it. So this is pretty much, in my view, a perfect forecast for Frechette. Fire weather, on the other hand, is perhaps a different issue. Uh, and we've already seen that with extremely dry weather on the coast resulting in that fire near Squamish already, which is pretty unusual as far as I'm concerned to see fires like that on the coast this time of year. Anyway, uh, I do want to show you the next slide, which is the freezing level. This is for next Tuesday, so it's when we're in the warmest period here coming up. And it's basically, uh, you can see the little plus marks and then the meters elevation of the freezing level, and it's really high. So for most of BC, it's getting as high as between 2,500 meters along the Rockies to near 3,000 meters in the South Coast range. So quite high across the Okanagan to getting fairly close to 3,000 meters, which means finally we'll start to melt to a, a higher elevation. And actually, if we back up here to the uh, upcoming week, just look at our overnight lows. We've been having frost for quite a while, but now finally the temperature is in a place where I'm going to get some plants out there. And it's maintaining quite a bit above zero for overnight lows. So this will help to ramp up the, the melting process at least at mid elevations. And even at higher elevations, it'll be uh, starting to melt with those higher freezing levels as well. I'm going to go a forward a couple of slides and just talk about precipitation. And th this is the only slide I'm really going to show you about long-term precipitation. That's because beyond about 10 days, it's not reliable. So don't let anybody tell you they can forecast precipitation beyond 10 days. But I decided to put an interesting graph here, which is the amounts of precipitation forecast, this is for Kelowna, for the next 10 days from various countries. And it's pretty, pretty light with a couple of exceptions. Nobody is forecasting in the next 10 days anything more than about five millimeters, so like the two to five millimeter range, except Canada, which we're forecasting something happening next week with uh, precipitation getting into the range. And this is accumulated too for the whole period getting to about 15 millimeters and over 16 by the US GFS. And uh, to tell you the truth, the US GFS isn't one of my favorite models. And the Canadian model is actually usually over exaggerating precipitation as well. My favorite is the ECMWF, which is the European model here on the, showing up the bottom on the, in the bottom graph, below the graph on the far left. They're kind of in that bluey purple color. So just a few millimeters, which seems really reasonable to me. So basically all said from this graph, I think it's going to be dry over about the next 10 days or so. That being said, there are some models indicating wetter conditions, but I don't really believe them. The next slide is the temperature forecast for mid-April through to mid-May. So I think we have rounded that corner from the colder weather that we had over the last two or three weeks. And we're into a period now when we're on the verge of either no category chosen or near average and probably above average. That little uh, area of orange yellow coming in from the south there across the BC border is actually the Okanagan Valley. So we're forecasting for the next month in general, higher, the highest likelihood will be above average for temperature. So that adds on to the forecast I gave you for next week, which is generally above average. And again, continuing that above average type temperature scenario through till mid-May. This pattern continues into the forecast for the, the much longer range for May through July. And uh, so this includes the last month of spring and the first two months of summer. 
And for the Southwest interior for that period, there's three categories that we forecast. And of the three categories, the one that's being chosen as most likely for our AI is warmer than average. And I think once you add on to that, on top of it, climate change is resulting in a swing towards warmer temperature overall. I really have high confidence in the fact that I think the rest of spring and into early summer, early and mid-summer, it will be warmer than average. Uh, that being said, there's always variability in weather. So we'll see probably in general warmer than average conditions with some colder or closer to average periods interest first. So that's the outlook for the longer term. I just wanted to remind you a couple of tools. Our official Weather Canada app, which is available on at Google Play and in the Apple App Store for uh, most newer and recent phones, is an awesome resource. Uh, we have radar imagery in that that combines the Canadian and U.S. radar. So it's great in the sense that you can see stuff coming up through from Washington. Uh, we can't see this as easily you know, on the internet. I would say our app is the best place to, to view that. And as well, uh, I should put a new picture in here because our latest version of this app, when you look at the now conditions, actually has the last 24 hour conditions. So ba basically the temperature winds and that type of thing back for the last 24 hours. So the app is constantly being improved at a very useful resource to watch weather throughout the summertime and the rest of spring. There's one thing I'd like to note if you haven't already got on it uh, for emergency managers and municipalities, um, not for the media, but for general uh, emergency management community, we have weather notifications we send out for the emergency management community about possible risks coming up. If you aren't already on our email list for this that comes from the Warning Preparedness Meteorologist in Environment Canada, flip me an email and I'll get you on this list. Uh, this is something available to all the public, and I think it's a great site to go just to get a general synopsis of what the weather is looking like for the next week or so. It's an, the Avalanche Canada site slash weather. So avalanche.ca slash weather, and it's a description of the weather over the next week or so. It is focused mostly in the wintertime to the higher terrain, but it's certainly of interest to uh, all persons. Um, throughout the year and I think we keep it going throughout the summer uh, perhaps not updated as quite as frequently or as much but certainly keeps going and I just threw in a couple of slides for general interest and these two slides relate to perhaps climate change and we do have climate change in our name of our department now so uh, this slide is a favorite of mine and it relates to what uh, Sean and I think you showed there Nelson what might happen with climate change to our snowmelt pattern and uh, what this slide shows is in the past in red we tend to have more of a delayed melt and a fast peak on things as uh, the melt gets going a little later in the season with the cooler climates of past history as we go forward into a warmer climate we may have higher flows in winter which was corroborated from some of the earlier presenters and perhaps an earlier and reduced snow melt peak flow. This would of course depend on how much snow we get over the winter, but we have seen that type of thing happen in the last few years. And then because the snowpack is tending over, you know, with the climate change scenario, tending to want to melt a bit earlier than it used to in the past, what does it leave us for uh, available water in, during in the summer? So I'm concerned about that. Do we, uh, we have to make sure that we manage the possible peaks that can come but also remember that we might have a longer period throughout the summer to make it through with the water that we're given from the winter snow melt. And the last slide I have here is because this is on our minds recently, and we're wondering how meteorology might affect COVID and the transmission of this very sad and deadly disease. There is some link to uh, climate or weather, I mean. So um, I don't know why they say climate because it's really climate has nothing to do with it's actually whether this particular slide comes from India I grabbed it from the economic times India times and the studies from MIT are saying that warmer and humid weather may actually uh, link to a slower spread of coronavirus so I'm hoping that we're going to forecast some warmer weather we certainly already are into a more westerly flow patterns here in BC that will bring us higher humidity 
compared to the very dry conditions we've had recently. So perhaps this will be of benefit. So I can't wait to see how things work out with this throughout the summer and how weather actually plays a factor in the transmission of diseases. And uh, I'm definitely available for comments and questions at the end of it. And there's my email address. I'll leave this on the screen. If you want to flip me an email, have any questions of any way, shape or form, I'd be happy to answer them. And there you go, Nelson, that's my presentation. It's looking warm and fairly dry, at least for the next little while. Thank you very much, Doug, and, and thank you very much for our panel. That concludes the, the content piece of today's webinar. I have two questions, one for David and one for Sean. Uh, David, the question uh, coming from Megan Turcato is, you mentioned some localized areas of the Okanagan are at high risk for flooding. Which areas in particular are, looking, are you looking at and do you have any advice for residents living in these areas? Yeah, so the, some of the key areas include uh, in and along the uh, eastern and through to the northeastern uh, parts of, of the watershed. So uh, headwaters of Mission Creek and coming into Kelowna up through to uh, the Vernon area are, are where we're seeing the highest snowpacks. Um, I think uh, in terms of um, preparedness, uh, the usual uh, seasonal preparedness, and I would say this is the, the case across the board, not just for areas where we have the snowpack. Uh, and I know that um, Emergency Info BC has some really good links of what uh, residents can do to, to be prepared, but uh, kind of the usual things like, um, you know, if people are in uh, flood flown areas, uh, being prepared, having uh, uh, stuff in their uh, yards uh, secure and, uh, and uh, being aware of uh, recommendations that are coming out from the regional districts in terms of uh, response, uh, I think are, are some of the key, key things. Great, thank you very much. And we have a second question for Sean, and it is, uh, is, it, um, is it high inflows or why is Kalamalka Lake not drawing down? Um, there's a couple of reasons there. One, uh, we just don't have the uh, ability to draw down um, Kalamaka Lake like we do with Okanagan Lake. And that is because uh, back when the Okanagan Lake regulation system was developed, it really focused on uh, Okanagan Lake. And the uh, channel immediately below the dam in Penticton uh, was, was dropped down. And so this is what really gives us our ability uh, to um, keep water flowing at, at higher rates throughout uh, the year. Uh, we don't have that same ability uh, on Kalamaka Lake. Again, when we, the sill elevation, I don't wanna get too technical here, but um, basically there's just not enough pressure to push the water out uh, until we start getting higher lake levels. And then the second part of that question was about uh, inflows. And I think uh, we were seeing a lot of uh, low elevation melt uh, through that, um, you know, February period, as well as uh, potentially some of the uh, groundwater is higher up there, like uh, John Poxon uh, re referred to. Great, thank you for that. Um, that concludes today's presentation. I would like to thank the entire presentation team. It was it was another great update. And I'd also like to thank all of the, the people that participated. Uh, at one point we had uh, close to 80 people watching today and I think that's great from across the Okanagan and abroad. And uh, with that, I hope that everybody uh, stays safe and uh, look forward to doing a similar presentation in 2021. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Nelson.